On June 4, 1989, the Chinese government ordered the People's Liberation Army to turn its weapons and tanks on innocent, unarmed students in Beijing's Tiananmen Square. Welcome to Dissidents and Dictators, a series of conversations by the Human Rights Foundation dedicated to exposing and challenging authoritarianism around the world. On the 31st anniversary of the Tiananmen Massacre, the Human Rights Foundation spoke with American investigative journalist and Tiananmen eyewitness Claudia Rosette, Tiananmen Massacre survivor and former political prisoner Yang Jinli, BuzzFeed News world correspondent Mega Rajagopalan, Chinese Canadian actress and beauty queen turned human rights activist Anastasia Lin, founding director of Hong Kong Democracy Council Samuel M. Chu, and Hong Kong based journalist and activist Francis Hui. Despite the Chinese Communist Party's best efforts to erase the truth of the Tiananmen Massacre, the legacy of the brave, peaceful, pro democracy protests live on. Welcome, and thank you for joining us as we commemorate the Tiananmen Square Massacre that took place in Beijing on June 3rd and 4th of 1989. I'm Céline Bustani, the Chief Program Officer at the Human Rights Foundation. 31 years ago today, Chinese troops killed thousands of peaceful protesters near Beijing Tiananmen Square. These protesters, most of them students, were advocating for democratic reforms. Today, the memory of this massacre serves as an important reminder that for over 4 billion people across the world who live under authoritarian regimes, there is little or no opportunity to challenge oppression and violation of human rights by police and government leaders alike. It's been very interesting for us at the Human Rights Foundation as we prepare for this event from our headquarters in New York. Over the past week and a half, We've also experienced and witnessed here in this city and across the United States, a protest movement in response to police brutality and racial injustice. This reminds us that it is important to maintain and continuously strengthen the mechanisms that ensure the promotion of democracy and to hold governments accountable for violating human rights and the rule of law. But the last week has also been a powerful reminder for us that here in the US, we can protest against police brutality. We can organize, we can peacefully assemble, we can express our outrage. These rights simply do not exist in China. In China, mothers who have lost their sons and daughters at the Tiananmen massacres, massacre are not allowed to mourn publicly. Online and in Chinese textbooks, the government continues to heavily censor any mention about this historic event, hoping to erase it from history altogether. In Hong Kong, for the first time in 30 years, the largest annual vigil for the massacre has been banned with a misleading cause. The government's violent crackdown of the student-led democracy movement on that day in 1989 is one we've seen repeated by dictatorships across the world. In these countries, there's no freedom of expression, no civil society participation, no independent judiciary, no independent media, no authentic elections, and citizens are not afforded the freedom of thought, religion, or association. This is why government institutions and civil society organizations that work to preserve democratic ideals are so crucial and so precious. Over the next two hours, we will hear from individuals who have witnessed and survived the Tiananmen massacre or grown up in its aftermath, as well as from journalists and human rights activists who are tirelessly working to challenge China's authoritarian regime. Our first speaker is Claudia Rosette. Claudia is an award-winning investigative journalist and editor. She is known for her groundbreaking investigative stories, exposing human rights abuses and corruption. For more than three decades, she has reported from Asia, Latin America, the Middle East, and the former Soviet Union. She earned an overseas coverage, sorry, she earned 
an, an overseas press club citation for excellence for coverage of the Tiananmen Square protest in 1989. Claudia is joining us today to talk about her experience as an underground reporter that day and the legacy of the massacre 31 years later. Hi, Claudia. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for the chance to speak here. Thank you all. So that day on June 4th, 1989, you were actually in Beijing reporting for the Wall Street Journal. And you witnessed the tanks rolling into Tiananmen Square, where hundreds of thousands of Chinese citizens took over the center of Beijing and cities across China to demand freedom. What worked this historic moment? The rare time in history when Chinese people spoke freely inside their country to demand democracy. What did the movement mean to the people and what did it mean to the Chinese government? Tell us more about the sentiment at the time. Let's just go back briefly to where China was coming from. In 1949 came Mao's Communist Revolution, the founding of the People's Republic of China, which they just celebrated the 70th anniversary of in Tiananmen last October. And the decades that followed, uh, he just beggared China with communist rule. China missed out on all that post-World War II development. And when Mao finally died in 1976, in the late 70s, Deng Xiaoping came, rose to power and said, we're going to reform the economy. We're going to have a market opening. And what happened was, what, what began to happen was what we all hoped to see in China continue to a free country. Uh, as they began allowing people more economic freedom, people had a chance to also say, we'd like more democratic freedom. We want political freedom. And this... Uh, had reached the point, there were demonstrations in 1987, they were stopped. And in 1989, a set of things came together. Uh, the economy was taking a downturn after beginning to look better <laughs> from nothing uh, under Deng Xiaoping. People were unhappy with the economic downturn. And then a reform, a reform ousted member of the Politburo Bureau, Hu Yabang, died. His funeral gave people a chance to come together protest, which is one of the things that communist rule tries to stop, is it isolates the individual so you cannot get together and demand things. This grew into demonstrations, which then kept going because China had a lot going on. Mikhail Gorbachev came to visit. They didn't want to shut things down in front of the world cameras. This went on. They occupied Tiananmen Square. Uh, and basically, it arrived at the point where for two weeks, the people of more than two weeks, actually, it was two weeks under martial law before the crackdown, but the people of the world's most populous communist state took over the capital city. Uh, they were running Beijing. The, the government withdrew. There were troops around the city. And then, and it was an enormous peaceful protest. It was spreading across China. They were having protests in Shanghai and Guangdong, all over the place. And uh, then, as you know, on June 4th, Actually, in the sort of late hours of June 3rd, the army came, moved in on the city. And where I first saw it was troops followed by armored personnel carriers uh, moving down the big avenue, Chang'an Avenue, into Tiananmen Square. And I went ahead of them where they were simply shooting into the crowd. And they formed up on three sides of Tiananmen, uh, shooting from the the south, the other, the fourth side, and the standoff ensued overnight, which was just haunting. I mean, to this day, the most haunting story I've ever covered. And finally, they shot, sort of continued shooting people in the square. And just before dawn, uh, the students, the protesters, they weren't all students, they were protesters of many kinds, but we think of them as students because they were the core of the protests. Actually, there were workers there, there were everything. Um, finally marched out at gunpoint and the PLA took over the square and they went back. It took some days before China's Communist Party had really subdued that. People continued. One of the things I saw as I left the square and went back to my bicycle, which everyone was riding bicycles around in those days, was young men coming out to throw rocks at the tanks that were rolling down the avenue at that point into Tiananmen Square. A symbolic gesture. You can't do much to a tank with a rock. That's how angry people were. And 
if I may just say, the thing that we mourn today is not, not only the people who actually were killed there or the people exiled or jailed, uh, although that was terrible. It was the loss of what China could have been, could be, were it a free country. I just want to show you all. I picked up on the way out of Tiananmen that morning of June 4th, as everyone walked out, one of the protest banners that was lying crumpled on the on Tiananmen, on the pavings, the flagstones of Tiananmen Square. Uh, it was a tattered mess. It had been through all the protests. But here it is. I don't consider that it belongs to me. It belongs to the people of China, and it will go back there on the day when China is a free country, and they will receive it with the honor it deserves. So I remember in, in an article you wrote 10 years ago, uh, commemorating the 21st anniversary of the China massacre, you stated that China will be a modern country when it no longer fears the memory of June 4th. China has obviously achieved great economic modernization, lifted millions out of poverty, but its systemic repression of dissent and the one-party system signal that even today your statement still holds true. Has nothing really changed? Has anything really changed on a social and political level, including the method of repression? Not in an important and fundamental way. It's still all about power. You know, you people became freer to earn profits, to make some money, but they are not free to say what they think. They are supposed to be this robotic mob sort of agreeing now these days to Xi Jinping thought. Uh, this is a grinding thing for the human soul. It's pretty much that simple. People like to be free. It's how we're made. And I uh, the great rebuke to this is both Taiwan, which was a clear demonstration that you can have a Chinese polity that is both wealthy and free. You don't need to make a trade off the trade off that the Chinese government and Communist Party presents, which is fine, we'll let you make money, but you're going to do everything we say and bow down to us. We call all the shots. No, you can actually have both. Uh, Hong Kong's free society is another rebuke to that, and which is why they are destroying it right now. Um, I find it sad and horrifying that China would choose June 4th of all days to ensure that Hong Kong passes a law criminalizing disrespect of China's national anthem. One would have wished that China would try to earn that respect rather than impose it with coercion. Yeah. And that is the difference in China itself. It's That's still the same basic problem. It is the same fight. It's the same showdown. It's very inspiring to see how Hong Kongers have defied the ban today and uh, they have, you know, they still uh, went out to, to express their, their anger. And it's really, it's really moving to, to see that. Yeah. Um, but how do you think, how has state surveillance helped advance this goal, which is making sure this kind of protest on the scale do not happen again in China, inside China. Yeah, unfortunately, all the great technological advances that have brought so many good things uh, have also enabled China's Communist Party to set up things out of George Orwell. They can now, with facial identification and tracking of the apps for spending, you know, people don't really use cash much in China anymore. They use spending apps and everything is recorded. So they can follow everything. And they do, <laughs> as we saw with the doctors who tried to blow the whistle on the coronavirus mm -hmm. uh, at the end of December and were immediately hauled in and reprimanded as rumor mongers and shut up, which might otherwise have spared China and us China inflicting that on the world. Um, but that's the problem. There was there was tremendous surveillance even 31 years ago in 1989, but there was some room to slip through it because they simply they had sort of had to do it some of it manually. <laughs> they were trying to follow without all the technological advantages they now have. Um, and this is what this has now produced is an even more centrally controlled uh, command and control state. And with the rise of Xi Jinping, who is an extremely ruthless, voracious for power, predatory dictator, 
uh, they've made incredible use of all these technologies. So it's much harder for anything to slip through a net than it used to be. Mm. Indeed. Now, to, to end on a, on a hopeful note, tell yes. us how can people in democracies overseas help elevate the voices of those who hope for freedom in China and in Hong Kong? Um, what can we do to elevate that cause and to support them? We can do the thing that the people in Tiananmen Square asked us to do. They asked it over and over and over during those sleepless nights in Beijing in 1989. And it's the thing I have heard from actually people around the world when they rise up and ask for freedom. We can tell the truth. It starts with that, tell the truth. Uh, it is so tempting for economic reasons to defer to China to just smooth it over and think, I, I'm not going to fight this. It's too expensive. It's too difficult. Uh, we've seen people be enormously powerful people, wealthy, famous people bullied that way. Uh, we can stand up to that and tell the truth. And then we can focus on the actual individual stories, what's going on. We can call out what should not be happening. Um, just keep telling the world. That's what individuals can do. There are things governments can do to stand up to China. But as far as what you and I can do, look with your eyes open and talk about what you see and listen to what's coming out of China, to the bloggers who try to tell us past the Great Firewall what's really going on. There was a, as the Wuhan lockdown was imposed, there was an incredibly moving video that a young man made in Wuhan. Um, he was sitting there with a face mask. I hope they have not identified him with their incredible surveillance because he would not go well with him if they did. But he was talking about what a terrible government this was in China. And he said, don't believe that we're all brainwashed. We're not. Mm -hmm. He said, we know what's going on. It's just, we can't do anything about it. They have the bullets and the tanks. So keep faith with that, that there are people in China who do understand. And whatever you hear sort of through the official filters, remember the efforts that they made, that incredible uprising in 1989. That is the real voice of China. I believe that was the only time since, really since Mao's founding of the People's Republic, that they had a real chance to speak directly to the world. Let's honor the people who stood up in 1989 to defend freedom in China, who showed us what China could be if it's ever a free society. I expect someday it will be, I hope it will. And can we honor the people who are out there right now as we speak, calling for freedom, warning those people in Tiananmen and telling everyone, value your freedom, calling for a free society in Hong Kong. So thank you for hearing that message. And thank you for your outstanding work, uh, telling the truth and spreading the truth. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you for having me. Thank you all so much for being here. I am a correspondent for BuzzFeed News and um, also the former China Bureau Chief. Um, it's my great honor today to introduce Dr. Yang Jian Li, a formidable advocate who has spent his career championing human rights and democracy in his native China. Um, Dr. Yang was part of the pro-democracy movement at Tiananmen Square, and he witnessed the government's brutal crackdown on student demonstrators in June 1989. After that, he earned PhDs from Berkeley and Harvard um, in the US and then returned to China to work on nonviolent activism for the labor movement. And as a result of that work, he was sentenced to five years in prison, um, much of which he spent in solitary confinement. Dr. Yang was released after an international outcry in 2007, and he has continued his activism um, on behalf of human rights and, and democracy uh, from the U.S. And um, I'll hand it over now to Dr. Yang to speak a bit about his experience um, in 1989. Hello, Mega. Thank you for your kind of introduction. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is a particular day. Uh, 31 years ago, um, 
the Chinese government responded to peaceful demonstrations in Tiananmen Square with machine guns and rolling tanks. And the student, the previous student who had demanded for political reforms to make the government more uh, uh, more responsible and apparent and more democratic uh, were crashed and many young lives were lost. And the demand of the brief student are still relevant to present day China. Everybody knows we feel under the same regime that gunned down so many innocent lives uh, 31 years ago in Tiananmen Square. The same regime that continued its repression and intensified its repression in recent years to this day. So I, I'm, I'm glad that we can get together on this day to um, commemorate the brief lives, the hero, and also to look at the current situation in China, to summon our courage and wisdom to face uh, the formidable uh, enemy of freedom, that is the Chinese Communist regime. And we come together with a concentrated effort to help China to become more democratic and help the people of China to gain their freedom. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Young. Um, so I want to um, remind those of you who are watching along with us today, please go ahead and, um, and ask a question, if you can, um, using the ask a question bar below. And um, I'll, I'll um, be able to moderate and put those to Dr. Young. Um, I'll start with one of my own, if that's OK. Um, you know, it's impossible this week to not ask uh, this question. Um, you know, last week and this week, we've seen political leaders in the U.S. Um, again, call for violence against protesters, um, you know, specifically using the U.S. military. And it's impossible not to think about what happened at Tiananmen Square when we see that. Um, I know that you have um, spoken out before against uh, the remarks that President Trump made about pra praising the Chinese government's response to the demonstrators at Tian Tiananmen Square in 1989. And I was wondering for you this week, um, you know, what's been your reaction to seeing these developments in the U.S.? And do you have any advice or words of wisdom for the demonstrators um, that are protesting police brutality in the U.S. and elsewhere these past couple of weeks? Uh, this is a very difficult question. Um, of course, I have been following closely with uh, the demonstrations that is happening in U.S. And I'm very much saddened by what's going on for many reasons. Number one, and many demonstrators just uh, has gone violence and they become uh, rioters, uh, which is something we really do not want to see happen in any situation. And another side, the, any leader of the country facing this kind of situation has a tendency to suppress, suppress violently and control the situation, which is understandable. But the great leader should be very careful not to cross the line, to use the power in his hand to suppress the peaceful demonstration so that it will bring the disaster to the whole country that will not help with a resolution of the already existing uh, conflict and can only make the bad situation worse and even have a, a danger to threaten the function of the democracy itself. And I do see that tendency, but at, at this point, I want to remind the people uh, that um, there are two different things. The nature are totally 
the, the natures are totally different. And I do see some columnists and uh, um, make comparison between uh, Tiananmen demonstrations and the uh, demonstrations that we are experiencing here today. And some um, paper even put uh, a tank, a string of a tank and American people wearing a mask. And, you know, that uh, 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 implies that U.S. is experiencing uh, the same thing as um, what we had 31 years ago in Tiananmen Square, which I think is wrong. It's totally wrong. You know, it's a totally different thing. Number one, our demonstration were from day one to the end be, uh, were peaceful, peaceful from uh, very beginning to the end. There's no single case of a violence uh, committed. Okay, number, number two, U.S. still have a space, you know, the, the freedom of expression in the U.S. is guaranteed. Nobody actually can take it away. And uh, so far, the uh, U.S. police arrest so many people and use force to control the situation. But if, if I'm wrong, tell me. Just uh, give me an example or a few examples that um, those are arrested are peaceful demonstrators. This, you know, I my uh, assessment is my observation is you know, those arrested were rioters. Uh, they committed violence, but in China it's different. The those arrested are all peaceful demonstrators. Their only crime is exercising their right to peacefully express their mind. So this is a different nature, different nature. You cannot make a parent uh, between these two. It is wrong. We should have uh, such moral cl clarity to uh, discern these two different things. If we messed up, and uh, I, I mean, if we miss these two things up without uh, moral clarity, I think we will make serious mistake in this country. Okay, um, thank you very much um, for your candor with that. Um, let's go to one of the um, the audience questions now. Um, here's an interesting one from Tommy L. Um, how do you think Chinese activists who experienced the Tiananmen massacre would see the Hong Kong protests today? And can you compare and contrast those two movements? Yeah. Um, we see hope in Hong Kong and the young people in Hong Kong actually are carrying on the spirit of Tiananmen. Uh, they are the same in uh, their brief act to defend their freedom and push for democracy. And I see the same determin uh, determination in the young people as we had 31 years ago. But uh, the young people in Hong Kong are more equipped. I think they are stronger than we are, wiser than we were in Tiananmen Square. And they are um, spiritually stronger than we were because they uh, have lived in freedom and the rule of law. And what China trying to make them to uh, submit is their life they have already enjoyed for many, many decades uh, and even longer. And that's something different from what we demand. We, that time in Tiananmen Square, we had, uh, had no single day that we enjoyed freedom in China. So I think the people of Hong Kong treasure freedom uh, more than we do and have a better understanding of freedom than we did uh, 31 years ago. And they are also um, uh, materi materi materially uh, better equip equipped because now they have a modern 
technology for communication. They use the internet as a tools to organize, to, um, to uh, express and organize. And also they are very well, they are better connected with the international community, much better co connected than we were in Tiananmen Square. So I believe uh, the, the people of Hong Kong will continue their fight. They'll do much better job than we did 31 years ago and they will not give up. So this morning I just uh, published an article on National Review. The title goes like, Hong Kong is not dead. The tank men of Hong Kong can defy Beijing's rolling tanks. So the, the title uh, tells what I want to say. Hmm. Um, so here's here's a good one that I've heard myself uh, very frequently from Peter Hansen's. How how many mainland Chinese are aware that June fourth, nineteen eighty nine happened? And my question on top of that is, how do you ensure the younger generation is um, also aware of that history? Um, ever since the massacre, Chinese government has um, trying has been trying its best to suppress the truth about the Tiananmen and of uh, everything else uh, in the history of China. As a result, uh, the younger generation people in China may have heard something happened in that year, seriously, you know, something seriously happened in that year, but they have, many of them have no idea about the significance of that. And, uh, what exactly happened? What the you know the demonstrators, the students demanded for, and you know really the the government gunned down them, and how many people um, died? So this information, um, the uh, the younger generation people in China have uh, uh, very little idea about, and uh, their parents our generation actually um, because of um, uh, the political situation in China, where uh, even today, who those who die, who dare to tell the truth, face a serious persecution, refrain themselves from telling their children about what happened so that they can prevent their children from uh, making trouble. So, um, you know, this uh, tells a lot, this says a lot, how the Chinese communist regime rules China. So they rule China, of course, by force, by violence, but at the same time, by lie. And they have been lying to the people um, ever since they uh, took power. And uh, once the people in China are exposed to, to the truth, not only about the Tiananmen Square massacre itself, about anything, even about what happened today in Beijing, the, the regime would not sustain. So you know that better than anybody else. Um, so I think that's the situation. That is why I think the number one job for us to disseminate information to China and let people to expose one way or another to the truth, not only for the Tiananmen Square, um, but for what's happening around them and uh, what's happening today uh, with regard to their tax and uh, to their well being, to their jobs and uh, the government policy, how people make a policy. Uh, uh, it, uh, it, is the government actually doing things? in interest, in their interest, and so on and so forth. I think that's a very important job of us to do. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Yang Jin Li, for being here. Um, and I think it's uh, just about our time. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Anastasia Lin is going to be sharing her thoughts on what it was like growing up in China and how she came to learn about the massacre. Uh, thanks so much for being here today.
I was born in Hunan, Changsha, so uh, from the same town as Mao, actually. Uh, so when I was uh, 13 years old, I emigrated to Canada. Well, interesting. Uh, what was it like growing up um, when you were younger in China? What did you What did you learn in China? What was you know your upbringing like? So my family, my father is a businessman, and my mother. She used to be a university professor, and our in China we call it political background. That means Chinese citizens who's never been in conflict with the government, who's never spoken up and um, peacefully protested, who's never practiced Falun Gong, who's never been uh, in any kind of belief. These Chinese citizens who have kept their head down. So it. In my family's case, because uh, they were both successful people, so we were considered mm, the class that could move on to become communist members. So because my political background was okay, in school I was able to be elected as uh, student leaders. We call them banjang, which is class head. And uh, since elementary school, even since before that, since kindergarten, the songs that we learn at school have lyrics like the Communist Party is closer to you than your own mother, um, or that they're always glorious, righteous. And there really was no alternative, no other ideas and stories that were permitted besides a very narrow vision. Um, so I, because the society is structured like that, when I was a student leader, I had to do work um, to gather students together, make them watch CCTV, which is the official Chinese uh, mouthpiece, um, and let them learn about the different events. But of course, these are all fake news uh, that are happening in society. And then at the end of that TV viewing or um, performing uh, performance sections, there's have a discussion of all these students and they talk about their opinion but of course there's only one opinion that you can talk about and the information was not really as when i was in china internet was not not everyone had a smartphone um and of course it was censored but even in a textbook um, in the society there was no alternative news source all the media were just talking about Chinese Communist Party story. Very interesting. Um, did you ever learn about the massacre when you were in China, or when did you actually first learn about it? There were suppressed whisper, but it was always given out of context. And uh, I could say that I have never really heard of the event before coming out of China. And the first time I learned about it was when my mother, she at that time, the Hong Kong freedom of speech and press is still there. And so she brought back some Hong Kong newspaper that talked about June 4th. And when I saw that, it was something that I knew that the Communist Party back in China had told me that that's dangerous. It's something you have to stay away from. It's unpatriotic and it's bad for you. And, but I knew if I just look at it, there's no way back. It was quite exciting as well. It's fascinating. Uh, how, how did it make you feel when you discovered it? Was there anger? Was there confusion? What, what, what was the sentiment when you were going through that discovery? When I read about the article, that was completely a piece of new information that was introduced to me. I went online to search, I think for a few days after, I looked at all possible a documentary that are on June 4th massacre. And I saw the videos of the students that are being shot by the military and crushed by police, uh, crushed by the tanks. And I felt, I cried a lot, but at the same time, I felt like that was the piece of China that I knew that always existed, but I never saw it when I was back in China. It was a piece of integrity I innately knew that we had as a country, as a race. But at that time, it was a, almost a moment of confirmation, if that makes sense. Yeah, uh, that, that does make sense. That's interesting. Um, 
why why do you think the Chinese government keeps the state and this his, this history um, so secretive? What what makes it so powerful um, and so worthy of suppression? Because Communist Party wants to portray themselves as the legitimate ruler of China, and they want to say that we, they, the Communist Party, are the Chinese people. But that's not true. Communist regime is does not represent the Chinese people. And they have manipulated our history to make us believe, and with all those indoctrination, to make us believe that if you support the Communist Party, you're patriotic, you're a good person, the moral um, authority is completely altered to the hand of the Communist Party. So being hiding the truth to everyone and not letting them know that Chinese people have tried. And this is the first time that the youth have dared to walk on the street to oppose the Chinese Communist Party. But back when there was cultural revolution, when there were different movements of the Communist Party, uh, what they try to do is to scare everybody into silence, to pick a small number of public enemy and to persecute them in public, to make everybody not daring to speak up for their neighbors, for their friends, or even their family member, and uh, to expose private messages, things that could be interpreted as against the Communist Party and make everybody so scared. And by hiding the truth, that further discourages anybody who, to use their own faculty to decide what the truth is. Very, very interesting. Um, why, why is this, why is this state so important in this event, uh, so important for the global community to remember? Um, you know, why is it something that is worth remembering? outside of China, since it's not possible there, when the, re when the regime is trying so hard to suppress it? Because we need to remember that by standing against the Communist Party, you're standing with the people of China who have no voice, no avenue of recourse. I've spoken to dissidents who are locked up in labor camp. I've acted in movies to portray their stories. And what they describe to me is this endless darkness that you want to scream in the inside labor camp, but there's no one that's going to hear you, and the persecution's not going to end. And unless the Communist Party goes away, there's no way that your integrity or any rights can be back to you. And that kind of despair is felt by many people, but never heard. And I think it's important for the international community to speak up, because these people did tell me. When an outside leader, when an outside government talk about China, talk about Chinese Communist Party's persecution, it gives the people in China hope that they can hang in there a little longer, that they're not entirely alone. But that's not what we're seeing right now. Because of the political power, so many people just choose to be blind. Yeah, it's important to, to note that, you know, this kind of oppression and, and the events of Tiananmen um, you know, continues uh, on some scale in China, even if, you know, obviously not um, such an event, but th there are still, you know, the party acts, you know, continuously to enforce its, um, its, its power. Um, the Chinese Communist Party is also known to censor any content that is deemed sensitive or challenging, which is, you know, kind of a cornerstone of their powers is being able to censor and control the narrative um, you know, and in particular when that's about the Tiananmen massacre um, and and religious minorities such as the Tibetans, Uyghurs, and Falun Gong, or about the or about Taiwan and Hong Kong, these are all you know subjects that they actively censor. Um, the party also is known to threaten anyone that doesn't speak up or, or that does speak up against their human rights viol violations. You know, with all this backdrop, why do you continue to bravely continue your human rights advocacy? What makes you, you know, continue to take a stand and put yourself at risk potentially? Well, I don't think it's a choice. Um, it's, there's no alternative. 
when back in 2015, when my father was threatened by the Communist Party, I did think about not speaking out at all. And for a week after I got his message saying that the state security police has threatened him, I did choose to just keep my head down. But a Western journalist friend told me that in the past, what worked for Chinese dissidents is to speak up. It's to use, it's to speak as loudly as possible and use all the media intention as leverage to protect your family back in China. And it's proven to have worked in so many cases that when outside gives attention to Chinese political prisoners of conscience or cases of human rights abuse, their situation somehow uh, gets a little like less tense. Um, maybe their treatment in prison is a lot better. So I took a leap of faith and I didn't know if there was anything underneath to catch me. And I think every step of the way, and I'm pretty sure this is the same case for a lot of overseas Chinese and Chinese dissidents who choose to speak up, that every decision they take is almost like, am I gonna break the status quo this time and bring crazy persecution onto my family? Do I choose to speak up? It's always a chess game that you're playing. I guess I learned to live moment by moment and knowing that backing down and compromising is not the choice. It's not a choice. It's uh, very powerful. Um, it's been 31 years um, since the Tiananmen massacre. It was on June 4th. Uh, 1989. Is it still a secret in China? Do you think that it's still something that people don't know about or, or choose not to know about? I think it's still a secret in China. I have read very recently on Australian newspaper that um, there is a Chinese international student who were so angry that she learned about Tiananmen massacre not from their Western classroom because we all know about Chinese infiltration in Western universities these days. She learned about it from a poster on a wall of a movie. And after she learned that, she felt completely betrayed, not only by China, but also by Western institutions that don't dare to speak up for the very basic truth. Yeah, and, and you know, and to help spread awareness and, and you know, bring light to these issues, what what can we do? What you know? What is the the thing that we can do in the U.S. overseas to help people in China or you know, Uyghurs, Tibetans, Falun Gong, Hong Kongers? How can we, you know, not only bring awareness to these issues, but how can we help them fight these fights that are still ongoing, um, you know, within China and and near China? Well, the international voices is a one very effective tool that has been proven worked in the past and also don't compromise your own integrity and what you say that you believe you say that you believe in freedom you say that you believe in human rights then do that when chinese com a government comes with with money with threats don't compromise if you can show the chinese people that when the chinese communist party tried to lure you with either with fear or greed, that you are not going to give up your value, you're going to stand with the Chinese people, then they will have more hope that the changes they want to bring to China will have support from the outside. And also, there's another thing that I want to mention is the Chinese infiltration outside of border in right. the Western society through Confucius Institute, through United Front organizations, and these organizations are directly controlled by Chinese propaganda department. They act as an arm for the Chinese, um, the party and state apparatus. And they often are mobilized to intimidate, to threaten outside dissidents, be the Taiwan, Hong Kong dissidents, Falun Gong practitioners, Uyghur, Tibetan, we have all met them. They're there whenever, whenever we want to protest. They're there on the internet if there is a news breaking out about China's human rights abuses. They're there to create this idea that the entire Chinese society is against you. They represent Chinese people, but they don't. And within the Chinese overseas community, there are these so-called Chinese leaders, uh, Xiaoling, 
that they were trained inside Chinese conferences that are inside China to teach them how to tell the Chinese stories, basically to um, fight any kind of criticism toward Chinese Communist Party. And when they come outside, they might not come with tasks right away, but they're like seeds that are growing. When they need to be mobilized, they will be mobilized. And we need to pay attention to that and to really take care and make space for the Chinese communities that are outside that are being marginalized. I want to thank you. I don't know if you have any closing thoughts or um, or things you'd like to finish with, um, but I think that's a generally a great place to leave it. I'm really glad this is happening. Just so you know, that a few years ago, the situation was not even like this, that people were not able to talk publicly about it. And um, thank you very much for staying. So glad. Yeah, thank you. We're so glad that you could join us today um, for this event. Hi everyone, um, I'm Francis Hoy and um, I'll be kind of moderating this section, Hong Kong, the next Tiananmen. Um, a little bit of background about myself. Um, I'm an activist based in Hong Kong and Boston. Um, as some of you might recall, I spoke at the COVID con before. And um, today, as we come to the 31st uh, anniversary of the Tiananmen massacre, um, I think a lot of people have shifted the focus on Hong Kong, um, fearing that they would potentially see um, the bloody history being repeated in Hong Kong. Um, now we know that the National Anthem Bill has just passed in Hong Kong. Um, the resolution of legislating the um, security law on Hong Kong has also been passed last week in the People's Congress of China. And today it is the first time that the world's largest annual vigil on the Tiananmen Massacre is banned in Hong Kong. Um, so in this section, we'll be talking a little bit about what are the um, lessons the history has brought to the people of Hong Kong? And in return, um, what are the impacts the movement in Hong Kong has made to both China and the world? So I'm very glad to have Samuel here um, to talk with us on these issues. Um, Samuel is the founding and managing director of the Hong Kong Democracy Council that is based in Washington, D.C. Um, he has been involved in a lot of advocacy for Hong Kong during this movement. And as some of you might know, um, his father is Chiu Ming, one of the co-founder of um, Occupy Central, which contributed a big part in the Umbrella Revolution in 2014. So welcome, Samuel. I'm very happy to see you here. It's good to um, see you as well. It's always nice to see uh, and be connected, uh, not just here in the U.S., but actually all the way from Hong Kong. Great. Um, yeah, so because Samuel and I are in different locations, um, I'm in Hong Kong, and um, Samuel, you're on the West Coast, right? I, I am currently on the West Coast. I'm actually in California yeah. at the moment. Yeah, um, so we want to make this session conversational, which Samuel and I will both elaborate with the information we have um, in order to provide a more comprehensive scope to the audience. So Samuel, um, what do you, um, before we, I think a lot of the audience already have a lot of um, knowledge about the background of the movement in Hong Kong. Um, so I want to know more a little bit about how do you think um, the Tiananmen Massacre has contributed um, to Hong Kongers pursuit on freedom um, and had led to um, the movement in Hong Kong last year. Yeah, um, and, and it's, it's great to join you and it's great to join everybody who's online. Um, I, I think that uh, in some way um, you can trace um, a lot of the various parts and various iteration of the protest movement in Hong Kong all the way back to uh, the uh, Tiananmen um, Square protest and, and massacre. And uh, I was born and raised in Hong Kong. Um, the first million people march that I took part in was in May in 1989. I was uh, fairly small and young then, but I have vivid <laughs> memory of being on the streets. Uh, and, and I think that if you see sort of the, the bookend of uh, the million people that showed up in May of 89, I think with both the hope and aspiration that the movement in Tenement Square represented a shift and an opening and an awakening uh, of democratization in, in China, 
Uh, and then you fast forward uh, to the 2 million people march last year and to the now today the banning of the uh, largest uh, annual vigil to commemorate and remember those who are uh, killed uh, were killed in Tiananmen Square in 89. I think in one, what I think is clearly connected, and I think you see the legacy and the um, connection. And I think that it, it represents also the kind of ongoing struggle and the resiliency of um, Hong Kongers being reminded every year, and now for the last year, every day of every week, what they're fighting for. And I think that that is not just a symbolic annual, you know, sort of observant, a moment of silence, but it has become, I think, the the root and the grounding for all Hong Kong uh, people's, I think, consciousness about not only what happened in the past, but what is happening now and what is coming in the future. I see. Um, I do want to share a little bit about this because the first rally I won was actually um, one of the vigil um, when I was in elementary school. Um, so I I do agree with Samuel that a lot of us um, started our path um, on the um, in our knowledge about the Tiananmen massacre. Um, if not that, I went to. Um, or if not that I learned about this history, I probably wouldn't um, got into looking into, you know, the what happened in China and what happened to those people um, back in 1989. So, um, Samuel, I know there are always worries that um, Chinese, the Chinese government would repeat in Hong Kong what they did during the Tiananmen massacre. Does that resonate to you? Um, do you share the same kind of concern? Yeah, so I, I, I think two folds. One, uh, I mean, I, I think you and I are, are slightly different in age. Yeah. And, uh, and so, as you mentioned, my father was, um, you know, one of the, 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 the leading organizers and, and, and leader back in the Tenement Square movement and then, uh, you know, all the way into Umbrella. I think that generationally speaking, uh, so I'm the sort of the in-between generation where I have vivid memory as a child mm -hmm. of the Tenement Square, and then I um, have sort of even more firsthand experience of the protest movement last year and then an umbrella in 2014. So I, I think that um, in a way, uh, Tenement and the protests and then the suppression and the crackdown and the massacre that happened gave everyone in Hong Kong and in the world a vocabulary, a, a lens to actually interpret what is experiencing, what is unfolding right now. And so I think that's why I think it's so significant that you know, every year and then uh, when you discuss the uh, potential, you know, policy or any kind of uh, dealings with CCP and, and, and the Beijing government, Tenement is, is the primary set of vocabularies that people have. And I think that that is significant. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing that I think is also important is that it's really important for us to acknowledge that even though Tenement's happened in a large scale. It happened with global media attention, cameras, you know, camped out. We saw even with the crackdown, reporters who capture images like the tank man who stood in front of the paints uh, on June 5th, there has been hundreds and hundreds of tenement like events and crackdowns in China in different parts of mainland China, and now over the past year in Hong Kong, even though it's not in that large scale over a 24 hour period that we can sort of digest and and, and, and process, and what, there have been Tenement Square happening daily, weekly. Uh, and, and I think that that is something that we must also remember. Uh, it hasn't been 31 years since the CCP have cracked down on suppressions and and dissent uh, and dissidents and and have uh, jailed and killed in cases and tortured uh, dissidents. Uh, it happens every day and everywhere in China. Mm -hmm. 
I, I'm very glad that you um, mentioned that um, there is a gap in between us. Um, I was born in 1999, and um, so after the handover, actually. Um, and I think in recent years, um, I do notice there is a phenomenon or um, like a changes um, in how people look at the massacre. Um, in terms of like, um, I think a lot of the younger people, especially, they um, would see that as a piece of history. Um, and because for them, um, it is more like, you know, a history story um, because they they have never um, witnessed what happened um, it, during that time. And a lot of them think that it is time for us to let go um, and just, you know, look at that as, you know, a lesson to learn for them and you know focus back to what is going to happen in hong kong so why do you think it is still important to hong kongers well so i think in addition to what i i think said earlier about giving hong kongers in the world a a, a vocabulary or word you know a lens to 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 talk about uh the struggle for freedom the other is that let's be very honest i i I think that um, it is up to you and your generations of activists and leaders to figure out what is the best strategies and and, and um, action uh, going forward. And um, you have been leading. Uh, it is this generation of activists that has been on the streets and and has been in the uh, in the media, has been in the in the work of uh, figuring out what is the new and 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 strategy that will bring and continue to sustain this fight. And I think that that has been in full display this past year. Um, mm -hmm. I think the significance and the value of uh, thinking back and connecting to the history is that um, it, it has some valuable, um, I think, lessons and values that um, I think, again, continues to connect uh, the generations of leaders and activists uh, that I think are very important. We have learned some very important things, and it is in those remembering and learning that we um, can evolve and, and become better. I mean, just a very clear example, a very uh, simple example, is um, this today, uh, yesterday in Hong Kong, and June 4th is the first time in 31 years that the vigil um, has been banned. Um, mm -hmm. And, but Hong Kongers are, have figured it out over this past year is that you don't have to be in one place altogether in massive numbers exactly. to be relevant and to be uh, inspirational to uh, each other and to the world. And I think that you're seeing that kind of, um, you know, uh, decentralization, that kind of less bloom in every neighborhood uh, made this, you know, let this movement uh, take to the every corner of Hong Kong in a way that, Mm -hmm. uh, I think again is uh, you see the seed and, and and the thoughts of of the learning and the lessons that comes from Tiananmen Square, um, and comes from even umbrella movement from 2014, and how it gets um, it becomes a creative source that now has bloomed in a whole different way, and and this idea of being water and, and, and flowing into every parts of, um, of Hong Kong and, and really into the world. Yeah, I was actually in one of the vigil uh, in my neighborhood um, and I saw um, more young people are actually um, showing up on these kind of events um, because um, I guess it is kind of less like a commemoration. It's more like we now we have we have to use any um, all sort of chance to go on the streets and express our voice. So a lot of people, some of them still bring candles and some of them also bring like flags um, saying that, you know, liberate Hong Kong or Hong Kong independence. Um, I think it gather people back on the street and a lot of people are using that as an opportunity to just um, reunite it. So um, what do you think well, it, this is the first time that the government um, has banned the vigil. So what do you think this tells us about um, China's 
um, political agenda or um, what is it telling us? Well, I, I mean, first of all, I think that, um, I mean, this, uh, I'm, I'm saying this a little bit tongue in cheek, is that uh, this Beijing government and by, in, you know, complicit uh, in by the Hong Kong government and administrations, what they've done is that they have really um, show the world in very short periods of time exactly what it is that is their intention uh, in Hong Kong and um, in you know continue to uh, of this policy of uh, crackdown of strangling Hong Kong as a uh, uh, as a strategic not just economic and financial but really a uh, an outpost for the world uh, for a window into China, but also a way for information to get out and to be amplified into the world. So I think that that's part of what China is afraid of. And I think what this uh, crackdown and what this latest um, proposal around the security law, um, and I, I get asked often, you know, have we seen the last of mass protests in Hong Kong because of what has happened? Is this a sign? Is this ban citing the pandemic as being, you know, uh, I think it's kind of hilarious that they said you can only out have up to eight people. Uh, so I keep now telling people yesterday that you should just have nine people uh, see what happens. Um, because that defiance is what CCP's and the Hong Kong government and the Hong Kong police crackdowns is inspiring. It's this new infusion of understanding that lighting a candle and protesting over the last 31 years is not just a symbolic act. It turns out that it is a act of defiance. Mm -hmm. It is a actual statement that we're making and that we're telling the world and that it has consequences. Um, and I think that I applaud, I think Hong Kongers uh, who I think, you know, organize basically uh, candlelight vigil virtually online and in neighborhoods like you, the one that you participate everywhere, because they, you, your generations of leaders have now infused and reinvented and redefined what the June 4th remembrance means. Uh, and, and I think that it has given life. And I think this ban on mass protests has actually infused a, a, a new set of meaning. Mm -hmm. uh, let's light a candle as a act of defiance. Let them come and ban us. Let them come to get us if they can, but we're not going away. Okay. Um, I think we'll end here. Um, it is great to talk to you about how the history has taught um, Hong Kong and awakened Hong Kongers on our journey um, standing against China. Um, I think moving forward, it is important for us to continue um, fighting for justice, um, looking into the global news and don't forget what is happening um, around us, not just in Hong Kong, but also in Taiwan or in other countries who are suffering um, from just pursuing for democracy and freedom. Thank you for joining us and I will give it back to you. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's great to see you, Francis, and, uh, and keep up the fight.